Amos? Okay, Amos, the second chapter. We're going to start at the sixth verse. Now, what towns or what nations have already uh, been uh, prophesied against up until this point, according to chapter 2? What are the two nations? Syria was, in, was, which is actually Damascus, that was in chapter 1. What two nations have we talked about so far this, in chapter 2? You can, you can look at this. This is not a pop quiz. You can, you can use your books. Israel. <laughs> Israel. Judah, we're getting ready to talk about Israel in verse 6. Okay. But Judah, we talked about Judah last Sunday. And what was the other country? Ireland. Look at the very first verse of chapter 2. Moab. 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 Remember we talked about Moab? Okay. Okay, just saying, just saying if anyone was white or woke or whatever. Let's pick up with verse number 6 here of chapter 2 of Amos. It says, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Israel, and for four I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they sold the righteous for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes, that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor, and turn aside the way of the meek. Now, we're going to get into this a little more, but this is talking about how the rich people are oppressing the poor people during this time, okay? And how the rich people will go to the courts and they will bribe judges and have the judges rule against the poor people. You see, that's evil and wickedness, okay? Of course, we don't have any of that going on today, right? Okay. All right. Uh, But let's go a little further. It says here in verse 7, it says that pant after the dust of the earth on the head of the poor. That is actually, um, how can I say that, Um, a metaphor or something of that nature. They're saying here that these people are so wicked that they even desire the dust off the heads of the poor people, that they're robbing the poor people that they even want to take the dust off of their heads. That's an exaggeration, but it's showing you just how wicked and evil these, pe- these people are. All right? And it says, um, And a man and his father will go in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. We'll come back to that in a moment. Let me get through a little more of this text. Uh, and they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the condemned, in the house of their God. Uh, Verse 9, Yet destroyed I the Amorite before them, whose height was like the height of cedars, and he was strong as the oaks. Yet I destroyed his fruit from above and his roots from beneath. Also I brought you up from the land of Egypt and led you 40 years through the wilderness to possess the land of the Amorite. God has to consistently remind them, Hey, you know, you guys would still be in Egypt if it wasn't for me. You'd still be in bondage. Um, and then it goes on to say, And I raised up for your sons for prophets and your young men for Nazarites. Is it not even thus, O ye children of Israel? Let's stop right there. So this prophecy is going against Israel, as we see right here. All these other surrounding nations have been prophesied against. Judah was prophesied against. Now it's, we're coming to Israel. All right. And, and where is the prophet Amos from? Originally, he's from Judah, from a town called what? Starts with a T. Tekoa. You find that in the first chapter. Okay. So he's, he's, he's traveled from Judah to Israel to prophesy against Israel. And he's laying some heat on Israel because Israel, once again, they're supposed to be the nation of God. They're supposed to be the people of God. They're supposed to know better. But, but God is pronouncing great condemnation upon them. Now let's go back up here to verse number 7. It says that a man and his father will go into, in unto the same maid to profane my holy name. That is wickedness. Now, back in the Bible days, a lot of the pagans would have um, uh, sexual encounters. They would have temple prostitutes as a part of their worship to their pagan gods. Now, I do not know if that's the case right here. It says a man and woman go into the maid. I don't know if the maid... We don't know the status of this maid. You know, uh, uh, she may not be a prostitute. She may have been someone who was taken advantage of. We don't know the situation. But it is still sexual perversion. It is something that is displeasing to God. And we have proof text of that. I want you to hold your place here. Turn to the book of Leviticus, the eighth chapter. Turn to uh, Genesis, uh, uh, Genesis, Exodus, and then Leviticus. 
If you wind up in Numbers to Deuteronomy, you've gone too far to your right. Leviticus 18. <clears throat> I'm sorry, what did I say? I meant Leviticus 18, I'm sorry. Leviticus 18, are we there? Now look at verse 8. That's where I got the 8 from. Leviticus 18 and 8, you see that? It says, The nakedness of thy father's wife shalt thou not uncover. It is thy father's nakedness. And basically what that is saying is, is that um, no, uh, a son should not have any relationship with his father's wife. Is basically what that's saying. Period. Okay. Now that's not repeated again in the New Testament, but it doesn't have to be. It's just wickedness by itself. Okay. Now if you look down um, at verse 15, it says, Thou, are you, verse 15 of Leviticus 18, see what it says? It says, Thou shalt not uncover the nakedness of thy what? Daughter in law. She is thy son's wife. Thou shalt not uncover her nakedness. So God makes it very clear. Son, don't you mess with, with, with dad's girlfriend. Dad, don't you mess with the son's girlfriend. Well, not girlfriend, but wife. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my, my apologies. But, but you don't do that. So he makes two distinct commandments for that. But in Amos, what's happening? It's saying that the man and his son are going into the same ma maid, which is profaning God. Okay. And there's other Bible passages that talk about this, specifically in the Old Testament. Um, we don't have to go through them all. Uh, but when you get a chance, um, you know, in the New Testament, 1 Timothy 1, 9 through 10, it deals with fornication. And that's basically talking about the things of the, of the Old Testament. The Old Testament just gives detail. The New Testament just says, hey, it's fornication. Anything that's not between a man, uh, a, a husband and wife, any sexual relationships outside of a husband and wife is fornication. It's, it's an abomination to God. That includes bestiality. That includes homosexuality. I don't care what you see on TV and they have the little Toyota commercials or whatever where they got the, the, the two women or the two men driving along with the child having cereal in the morning or whatever. That's an abomination to God. According to God's word, I don't care what the world has to say about it. Any relationship between outside of a man and a woman in matrimony is an abomination to God, according to God's word. Okay. Uh, first Timothy, I think, is the first chapter in the ninth through the tenth verses. I think it talks about uh, uh, fornication. But I wasn't going to cover that for the sake of time unless you, you're forcing my hand, because I can, I can teach on that for an hour. Okay, but we, we, we want to get through, through at least a little more of Amos, okay? Okay, so... Um, now, we, let's, let's see if we can understand what else is going here in Amos. It talks about how the righteous are sold for silver and the poor for a pair of shoes. And then it goes on in verse 8 to say, They lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge by every altar, and they drink the wine of the, of the condemned. What is that actually talking about? Well, there's this, there's, that's talking about when poor people are either uh, taking the court and the courtrooms are ruling against them, bribing judges or things of that nature. It is also talking about when poor people uh, need money, they will lend something to someone else in exchange for money, and then that someone else will keep that item until they're able to produce the money again. It's the Old Testament pawn shop. Look back at your text. It's the Old Testament pawn shop. It said they lay themselves down upon clothes laid to pledge. That means that the rich people are taking the clothes that the poor people have pledged to them. Says here, I need five dollars. Take my coat and give me five dollars. And the rich man gives them five dollars, and the guy goes to do whatever he needs to do. The rich man, instead of keeping that coat in perfect condition until the poor man comes back for it, he lays it on the floor and he lays out in it and starts drinking wine and starts messing up the poor man's coat. Like it's his own. Like it's his own. So he's taking something that was meant to be a pledge, he's taking it and he's ruining it. Okay? Does that make sense what we're saying? Now there are actually rules that deal with pledges. Now a lot of people think, um, let me say this, let me see. It is our desire 
practically, whether you're a born-again believer or not, uh, debt generally is not a good thing. Now, debt is not a sin, but to not pay your debt is a sin. Okay? There's an understanding throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament that there are going to be times where people are going to fall on hard times and they're going to need to borrow money or they're going to need to get a loan. And um, we'll talk about this in a moment because I think even Jesus uh, makes a mention to, to when you lend or when you loan because there's an expectation that people uh, are not all born uh, at the same level. We like to have, in America, we like to think, you know, we're all, you know, in equal, equal. equal. We may have equal opportunities, but we're not all born in equal situations. Some people are born rich. Some people are born in poverty. Right? Some people are born uh, with the mother and the father. Some people are born as in a single parent household. People are born in different situations, and a lot of times it's nothing due of a fault of their own. They're just, you know, they were just born in a different situation. Okay? Amen. <laughs> All right? But, uh, and so there's going to be an expectation. Sometimes you may have to borrow money. It may be an emergency situation. Someone gets sick and you have to borrow $1,000 because of the hospital bill. That was something that was out of your control. And so God is not going to condemn anyone for going into debt. But God does have an expectation where he expects those to pay their debt. God has an expectation for the borrower. God has an expectation for the lender. And in this text, as we're talking about Amos, is criticizing the lenders because they are not treating the borrowers with the respect that God had told them to, re to treat them with. And I'm going to see if we can get some examples of that here uh, right now. Once upon a time, we were in Deuteronomy, weren't we? Let's turn back to Deuteronomy for a moment. I should have had you bookmark that. Uh, let's go to the 15th chapter quickly. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Okay. Go to 15.7. 15.7. Are we there? Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 15th chapter, 7th verse. Deuteronomy 15th chapter, 7th verse. Are we there? Okay. It says, If there be among you a poor man of one of thy brethren within any of thy gates in thy land, which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not harden thine heart, nor shut thine hand from the, thy poor brother. But thou shalt open thy hand wide unto him, and shalt surely what? Lend, Lend him. him sufficient for his need in that which he wanteth. Y'all see that? So God's already laying out an expectation of there's going to be people who are not going to be in good situation. There's nothing wrong with one having to borrow, and there's nothing wrong with one having to lend. As a matter of fact, God expects for us to lend and to help out other people. That's an expectation. Isn't that what you interpreted from that passage? Yeah. All right. Now, I want you to look and see what Jesus had to say about this in Luke, the sixth chapter, the 34th verse. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke. Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke 6, uh, Luke 6, 34. Are we there? Luke 6, 34, Matthew, Mark, Luke. Is there anyone in the Bible where they, that it says anything about interest? Uh, th there is a pa uh, there is a passage of scripture that says you're not supposed to charge usury, which is an, which is the Old Testament word for interest. They say you're supposed to loan the person the money, and then that person to give it back to you with with no usury. So if you do a keyword search for usury, you'll find the passage that I'm talking about. Okay, U S U A U S U A R U S U A R Y usury. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay, you took me back to my fourth grade spelling contest for that one. All right, uh, Luke six thirty four says, And if ye lend to them of whom ye hope to receive, what thank have ye? For sinners also lend to sinners to receive as much again. But love ye your enemies, and do good and lend. This is Jesus talking. If you have a King James Bible red letter, this is Jesus talking. Hoping for nothing again. Uh-oh. Jesus said when you loan, don't even expect for it to come back. But look what he says, and ye shall be the children of the highest, for he is kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. 
And then so he says, be ye therefore merciful as your father also is merciful. So if somebody is in, in trouble and need, then th th there's an expectation that we should lend. And there's going to be situations where one will have to borrow. Okay? <laughs> is this hitting too close to home for some people? Um, I want you to look uh, a little further. I think I got some more passages here. I want you to give, you know, Old, Old Testament, New Testament e examples here. Um, if you could turn to the book of Proverbs, Proverbs 19.17. Proverbs 19.17. Proverbs 19.17. 19.17. That was a good year. Actually, that was a bad year. That was when the United States entered World War I. But I digress. Um, Proverbs 19.17. It says, he that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given, he will pay him again. Y'all see that? Mm -hmm. God says, hey, when you, when you help the poor man out, you're lending to the Lord. You, you, you're doing something. You're helping the Lord out. Jesus, in the, in the Gospels, he said, uh, when you went to the jails to visit the people in the prisons, you were visiting me. When you went to go visit those who were sick, you were visiting me. Remember we talked about that passage a couple of days ago? And so this is kind of like an Old Testament statement of that passage that Jesus repeated in the, in the Gospels. So that when we lend to other people, we're actually lending, uh, lending to the Lord. Now these are texts that were given prior to Israel getting into the condition that they were in. So the prophets and the priests who were already in Israel should have been preaching this to the people of Israel where they would not be doing all of these crazy things. When someone loaned them a coat, they would take the coat and lay down on it and just dirty it up or whatever. Doing all these things, God, God had already given them specific instructions on how they're supposed to lend money to others and to help those out of need. These guys were in violation of that. All right. Now, now, is there a difference when it says, you know, somebody, it says upon the pity of the poor. So is it mm -hmm. you're giving and not lending because it's pity to the poor? I don't, I, I'm kind of torn with that. Does well, that make sense? Well, Jesus defined it as when you lend, you're, it's for us, we would call it giving, because Jesus said, don't expect don't anything expect back. Right. <laughs> so to me, that's kind of giving. That's true. But that's Jesus true. called it lending. Okay. Now, if the person wants to give it back to me, then great. Yes. But he, don't he, expect it back. You know, God will, pay, God will give it, will pay him again. God will pay him again. Okay. All right. But, yes, ma'am. I know we're not talking about giving and lending. I mean, we are, but that's not the whole thing. Well, you Concern. Yes, ma'am. I'm the listening. The world is now. The world is. You know, they don't want Christians to say anything or do anything. But when it comes to give somebody money, you can beat somebody. They expect the Christian to fall in line. And you see that all the time. You know, when something happens, oh, we don't want to pray in school. But if a tornado happens, well, that church down the street should be feeding the people. Mm -hmm. So, what does the Bible says about that? When you say feeding the poor, is it the poor in Christ or just saying the poor in poor? I mean, sure. of the world. Like needy people. Yeah. Yeah. Because, Except Panhandle. Yeah, because you have the thing is the, the, the government doesn't want us to pray in school, doesn't want us to do this. People don't want us to even go witnessing. But when a disaster happens, they expect the church doors to be open and they can use the church for they, what they want to use the church with. But then don't want the church to say anything to them. For example, this pandemic, they look for food boxes exactly. and whatever coming from churches. And they like, go to the, you know, for my job, they call the state all the time and say, hey, where can we get clothes? Where can we get food? Whatever. And then a lot of resources are just like churches. And they do ex they look to the churches for those things. Oh, you mean the same churches that the government commanded be shut down? Those yeah, churches? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Oh. I'm saying the government. <laughs> they, you mean those churches? But the government doesn't follow. And, the the government, Bible. and people and the people in the world and the government want Sounds you like to not um, witness to them, not to say anything to them, but they want that you know, you give. And that's what the church they all look like to say, Well, that's what Christians do. They're supposed to give to the poor, give them money, feed them, but that's it. Is that part of lending? Is that part of the Well you gotta look at it like this. There's good people in government and there's bad people in government. Uh, right. Like the California government. Everywhere. 
Yeah. Look at the Texas governor. He didn't shut down churches. Right. The California governor shut down churches. Right. So it's it's the individual person that's in the government that's doing it. Well, I'm There's good people it. in the government that believe in the Lord and go to church and everything. They may be the ones that's coming up and saying, hey, go to your church closest to you. They will help you. Jesus the bad said, people may be well, keeping their mouth shut that, and saying, that's not what I'm, I'm, that's, wait a minute, that's, that's, sorry. <laughs> I'm, that, that's not what I'm trying to say. I'm like, look, look, exactly, go to the church. But when you go, to, when people go to the church and the church says, I'm, I'm not going to help you, you get, they curse you out. They mm -hmm. say, that's what your church is here for. But they don't want to step foot in the church or even want right. to listen to a sermon. Yeah. That's the, that's that individual though. Right. Some people, but there's some a whole group of people. I mean, there's the world who doesn't believe. A lot of them don't believe in God. Right. And they don't want you to witness. They don't want you to say anything about God. But when an incident when happens, when they need something, they come they to you. They want you to open your the church for them. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm saying. Oh, we've had it here, sir. Yeah, times. you see it all the time, and then I don't, you know. That part of, we're going to get back I'm to sorry, but, I'm sorry what I just did to you, but I just wanted that. Romans 12, 19 says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in doing so, thou shalt heap coals of fire on his head. Be not overcome with evil, but overcome evil with good. So it's going to be on them, right. not on you. Jesus also said that if... Uh, uh, for us, and this is one of the passages that I deal with all the time, and you guys know the passage I'm about to say, where it says, Jesus said to pray for your enemies. Pray for, pray for your enemies. Oh, oh, oh. Pray for those that despitefully use you and curse you. If your enemy asks, asks for your cloak, uh, if he asks for your garment, give him your cloak also. If he wants you to walk a mile, go with them twain. All right? That's, that, that's the, what the... So if the church Well, the church is supposed to use spiritual discernment because there are people who do take advantage of, of, of the church. And we're going to find out later. Well, in, in the Old Testament, I want to say I've got to go back and find the passage. I think it is in Leviticus, if not Deuteronomy, where it says that we should have just balance for the uh, mighty as well as the poor, which means that, you, that it's not about the person being poor that makes them automatically righteous. No. There are a lot of evil poor people. Yeah. Okay. But God says to judge righteous judgment, whether the mighty, when, it's, when you see the word mighty, sometimes that's referring to rich people. It says whether you're, it's the, the mighty or the poor, you're supposed to judge righteous judgment. I'm going to have to go back and find that passage. But going back specifically to your point, we should use spiritual discernment when it comes to, to those things. There were people who, who came to Jesus uh, requesting one thing, but Jesus... Uh, you know, wanted to, to check their faith first. He says, oh, sell all that you have to the poor and follow me, and you'll have riches in heaven. So Jesus challenged individuals. He just didn't just give them what they want. He says, hey, do you have faith? And he challenged them. And so we as a church, we have to challenge those that come here seeking uh, help from the church. Okay? If someone comes and they say, hey, I'm down on my luck and I need, need some money or something. And they come at the beginning of church. We say, okay, we'll sit here. And once we're done, because we still have to carry on our worship to the Lord, which is commanded of us, we're out of time. Um, we'll meet with you, hear out your situation, and we will pray for spiritual discernment to decide whether or not your situation is legitimate. Because there are some people who have come, and we could tell right away that they were not uh, telling the truth, but they were trying to take advantage of the church, especially those that have been to the church twice telling the same story. Yeah. And we're like, you were just here last <laughs> month, <laughs> you know, and you're telling me the same story that, you know, you're trying to get back to Oklahoma City or whatever. What happened between last month, you know? And so in those cases, we are to use spiritual discernment to deal with those, those issues. But uh, the bottom line is, is that the scripture clearly teaches that God is going to take care of those individuals in the end. 
and that we have to do um, what we're commanded to do, and that's to uh, uh, love, love our enemies. I've seen at this church people different, I've seen it two or three times, people come, and it's different people, they come in and they want something from the church, but they're not willing, they don't want it bad enough to listen to a few words from you right. to hang around. No, I want it now or I, I got to go. Okay. And if you don't give it to them now, yeah. then they're gone. They won't come yes. in and listen to you yes. talk to them for a few minutes. Yeah. They don't want to hear it. And I've seen that happen. Yeah, I've had that happen to me. I, I personally escorted a, a, a gentleman out because he said, oh, I thought, you know, you guys were uh, uh, Christians. I thought you guys were, were you know, were, were you know supposed to help people. And, and I told him, yes, sir. I said, but I'll tell you what. I said, if you could sit because he came right after Sunday school. And we were getting ready to, to go into the, uh, the sanctuary. And I said, if you could just sit with us until after worship. Well, I got to be somewhere. Uh, and and, and we, I was like, okay, well, go. But I said, we're not going to deal with you because we got to deal with worship right now. We're getting ready to worship. And then he got mad, and I was like, see ya. And I, I, I escorted him out. I, as a matter of fact, that's probably the closest that I thought I was going to come to blows with someone here at this church since I've been at this church. Was that, that instant? No, no, they don't need it. They're, they're just, they were just taking advantage. You're hungry. You're going to sit and listen yes. to somebody if that person's going to buy you a meal. Right. Yeah. Listen to what got yes. To say. Well, now, now, and we've had people who have sat through uh, uh, a uh, a worship, and they met with the pastor afterwards, and we gave him some money. And I know this for a fact because I personally drove the guy to the hotel after worship so that he could stay up in the hotel, and he and because he was going back to Oklahoma City. A lot of poor people trying to get to Oklahoma City from Dallas. <laughs> So something's going on in Oklahoma City. Okay, but then two weeks later, I, I saw him walking out here. Okay, so, you know, he, he didn't make, if he made it to Oklahoma City, he came back. And so that let me know that there are some people who are fake who are still willing to sit through. But we still did our part. Now the blood is on. Now he's got it. That's between him and God. And as a matter of fact, I remember when the pastor told him, he said, look, this money that we're giving you is not the church's money. This is God's money. And the man said, yes, sir, I understand. Yes, sir, I understand. He was out there walking the next uh, sometime later. But now that's between him and God because our Bible tells us that God said, vengeance is mine, said the Lord. Now, I haven't seen him since then. And I pray that nothing bad happened to him. But if something bad did happen to him, I understand why. Because he took God's money and used it for something that he should not have used it for. Now, is that considered loan? That's not considered like loan. That lend. The church has a lend. Lending. To the well, poor. it's considered when you give to the poor, you're, you're, you're lending to the poor, but God is going to bless you. So that's kind of like a loan. Okay. Because when you lend something, somebody you expect it back. Right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You're going to get something back. And God said, hey, if you lend to the poor, I'll repay you back. Okay, so it is like a loan. Even though you're giving to that individual. Right, right, right. right. All right. But, but Jesus said in, in, in his word, and uh, I think this is in First Corinthians or whatever, we say this a lot when we're talking about tithing is more blessed to give than to receive. Yeah. All right. And so when you, when, you, when, you, when you give, that's something that the Lord wants us to have a heart of giving a heart to be able to give and to be a blessing uh, to someone else. A lot of times God will give you extra so you can take that extra and be a blessing to somebody else. And that's okay. why 